if you're looking for medically assisted treatment. We don't have within our system here the same sort of you know wide scope of medically assisted options for people who are who are looking for that, which is what makes methadone, I think, such such a powerful issue for people to come together around because because the choice is hasn't been there. The options haven't been there for, for a lot of people. Now I say this is a really big issue, and I want to make sure we're not we're not shutting down the conversation, but I also want to make sure that other people are getting a uh, chance to ask some questions. So I've, so I've got a show of four hands here. I've got one, two, three, four. And then I'd like to see if we've got any last questions just for the first two speakers before we move on. And then we're going to have another break in a few minutes. All right. So Jules. I was going to say um, actually a couple of quick points. One is um, about prescribing methadone. I. I've been. I've heard very a lot of people that have are, don't even have a drug addiction issue necessarily, but are being prescribed it for pain medi um, medication. So as a pain management thing, so they're not on heroin or whatever. They're actually just prescribing it for pain, which seems a little bit bizarre. But and um, I don't know if from a doctor's perspective or what, but I'm told that um, methadone is a lot harder on the body. Like it takes its toll on the body a lot harder than I, than heroin does in in like long term. Like it's a lot harder and it's harder to quit as well. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's an excellent comment, and it's I think it's going to connect really well with uh, Helen's presentation, which is about methadone and, and pain. So we'll have cool. a good chance to to, to dig into that um, in the white hats. Richard. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rich Cuddy I'm a former expansion uh, member from Start. I've uh, been with them from Start. I'm also with them when it first came out in 89. And there's a couple of things with Methanol. When I was, I was only on it for a year to tell you the truth. And it was a new thing. And, and there were a lot of guidelines for the, for the doctors as well. The doctor had to give me one on one counseling a month. Did you find out where I am with the heroin? How, how, on the medical line? How, how's it working? How my life go, is going? My living environment, the whole nine yards. Uh, that's not being done now to start with. Right? So, of course, we got this big breakdown with one-on-one with, -on -one with the doctor because you don't have that intimate feeling with the doctor to tell whatever the case is, but you have that where you've got that trust and you know, you're both on the same line. Uh, number two thing is, if, you know, being, being a former life practical nurse, nurse as well, the side effects, and we were not told the truth about methadone, and we still don't know all the side effects of all that. I swear that uh, uh, my rotten teeth started from methadone. Things like that that I can't prove, or that be proved. But um, I think that we have to be more educated, and we have to, it's up to us whether or not we want to do it. I go to St. Paul's, and I got this one doctor, I won't say who this, uh, but everybody knows, um, <laughs> that will come and try to get me on methadone. And I've been clean for three four months. Things like that. Right. So my esteem goes right now. Uh, right? And the biggest thing down here is, my name is Richard David Cunningham. Right? I know a lot of people by name. But people look at me and say, hey, yeah, I know you as a drug user. You know I think, right? And so identify as, as being treated as a human being goes a long way down here. <coughs> and support each other. You may not like your enemy, but you have to work with them. Yeah. Very true. <laughs> why um, in different provinces or in different, I guess, even different countries, why um, when, say, okay, say in Ontario, you if you are to be um, on methadone, any prescription higher than 120, you have to be prescribed by two separate doctors, and how come I'm on 260 in BC and only see one doctor? Yeah, yeah different provinces have slightly different regulations around methadone, and that's partly... I know because Health Canada, that's the ultimate responsibility for methadone, um, distributes power across the provinces and, and well, say, theoretically the territories, although it's really hard to get methadone in the territories right now, um, to, to run methadone programs 
kind of with the oversight of Health Canada, but each province gets to do it a bit differently. And so in some provinces, like Ontario, for example, it's you need a second opinion um, before you can get a prescription over 120. And here we don't have that. And I think there's been some debate about whether or not that's a good thing um, for, for a lot of people. But I don't know, are there any other comments around, around that issue? I know the, yeah. the um, there's a, a really dangerous practice when you travel with people who are on methadone and there's, you know, you either get the carry and go or you bring your script and get prescribed. And in, I think it was Montreal and uh, something to do with in Halifax as well, they have a completely different concentration. So someone on 260 is really going on 130. So I've seen people almost die from having this more concentrated methadone from another province just through that sort of Everyone knows how many mills they're on. I mean, if you go to a group meeting of a bunch of people on methadone, they're always telling each other how many mills they're on. If the concentration is different in one of the provinces in Canada, we we are going to kill somebody one day with this. It probably has already happened. But it's it's uh, again keeps pointing to the same kind of thing that there's nobody wanting input about what works better. Um, that would appear to be the problem, and I think that's one of the hopeful things about a, a meeting like this is that we should pass a clipboard around and have parents working with. Mm -hmm. um, people who are being prescribed and with activists and researchers and really create something where we can do some human rights work. Because um, that's true. That. I had the best nod in my life when I went to Toronto with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I got this methadone that was two, I take 260, which is a bottle like this, they gave me this, and we went to the, this conference we were at, and I'm hit the table and I was like whoa it's what always terrified me she doesn't know this but I, I was getting the hotel people to let me in her room because I don't know she probably went to buy cigarettes but I was just in this panic that she had died in her room because oh, of these stupid God. things about these concentrations but you, mm. I never know what to do I mean I, I know that there's other people that tell me I mean think how um, people who have children on that that are on they've been able to get these carries like this but um, often we're told it's five days or nine, 900 mils, whichever it is, and then you think, why give them a carry if you're going to cut it by two days? So you got someone with you, it's just, well, you've described that with, with people in full blown. It's just, it's insane. It's harm producing. I can't believe how stupid it is and arbitrary. And, and then I think the other thing we don't talk about enough is what happens to the physicians who do prescribe with a caring attitude, and there seems to be this constant threat of removing their license because they're kind. I'm not like, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, I should think you should be rewarded, and that yeah. your yeah. patient should yeah. say who's giving you the best care. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, I want to just check in with this side of the room and see if there are any questions specifically for our first two speakers before we move on to the next two.